Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. When Patty Dan met her husband, Willem, she was in her late 30s. Her dreams of a lifelong partner and family were all but complete. But then, reality struck. Minnie Driver stars in the ABC comedy Speechless. Here she is reading Patty Dan's essay, Our Story Ended with a Slow Fade to Black. The snowy night, I met Willem at a synagogue in New York City. I knew we would marry. But I did not know that it would only last ten years. He was sitting in front of me, and I fell in love with the back of his neck. The floor sloped down to the front, so I didn't realise he was six foot three, more than a foot taller than I was. He was from the Netherlands, the son of a Mennonite minister who was drawn to Judaism. I was the child of suburban, assimilated Jews. He was almost 40 and had never wed. And I was 37 and had just about given up on men, Jewish or otherwise. Soon after, he dragged me to the Lower East Side, where we met an old rabbi, who looked at us a bit askance and said wisely, You will have a sweet and crazy life together. Which we did. Nine years later... In April, our little family, Willem, Jake, our three-year-old son, and I, visited a friend's sheep farm in Connecticut. When we returned to New York, Willem parked the car on the street near our apartment. We walked from the car with Jake riding on Willem's shoulders. In the middle of the block, I said, Should we get the car seat? Willem said, What's a car seat? And with that seemingly simple question we entered a new kingdom. Over the next three days, Willem's personality began to change. He'd always had a bit of a temper, but one morning he asked if I had an ink pen. He sometimes used different forms of English words, but when I handed him a ballpoint, because we didn't own ink pens anymore, he began to scream at me. He agreed to go to a marriage counsellor, who advised Willem to have a checkup. I sat with a furrowed brow in the examining room as the doctor took all his vital signs. My husband was a marathon runner, in top condition, with healthy lungs and a healthy heart. But then the internist began to ask him questions. The doctor held up a paperclip, and Willem said, I know what it does, but I don't know the word for it. English was not Willem's first language, but... This was something else. I'm concerned, the doctor said. I'm scheduling a brain MRI immediately. I dropped Willem at his appointment five blocks away and went to pick up Jake at preschool. Before Willem got home, the phone rang. It was our doctor who said softly, I'm sorry, but I have very bad news. Your husband has glioblastoma which is the worst form of brain cancer. Jake had opened the refrigerator and was pouring orange juice on the floor. Do you want me to tell him? The doctor asked. Jake was tugging on my sleeve to show me his handiwork. No, no, thank you, I murmured. I'll tell him. Tell me one thing. Is he going to die? Yes he said. In the middle of the night, while Willem and Jake slept, I got up and googled glioblastoma. I read, The patient will slowly lose all memory, as well as all bodily movement. The next day, I found Willem reading on the couch in the living room. He was rereading a novel in Dutch by the author J. Burnleff called Out of Mind. It is about a husband who slowly loses his mind and ability to speak. I huddled next to him. 
Why are you reading this now? He shrugged. Maybe it will help me. I'm having trouble with words. Yes, I said, and took a deep breath. Do you want to know about the MRI? What's that? He said. The picture, the picture they took of your brain. Yes, thank you, he said. He had always been a formal man, but already his speech was different. And then as simply as I would say, we needed a new rug, I said, you have a brain tumour. He nodded and then went back to his book. A half hour later, Willem called to me while I was in the kitchen trying to feed Jake pasta wagon wheels without weeping. What's it called? The tumour? I called back as cheerily as I could. Glioblastoma! Trying to make it sound like a lovely flower. Willem's first operation lasted four hours. After, the surgeon came out. I stood before him, waiting to hear our destiny. We got most of it out, he said. I hugged myself. When is he going to die? One year, maybe two. Very few people ask that question. I don't know why I was so blunt. Of course there are miracles. Of course there are exceptions. But I wanted to know the worst case scenario. For me, that made me feel more in control. Even though I was acutely aware, I was in control of nothing. Live in the moment. All you have is the day. We're all terminal. These phrases ricocheted through my head. Some friends immediately looked up Willem's illness and forwarded their dire discoveries to me. Others told me it must be because he used a cell phone, although he did not own one. Blueberries, wrote a friend on a postcard from California. The antioxidants will do it. Blueberries are the key. Willem was a historian. He worked as the director of a photo archive and spent so long on his doctoral dissertation that I called him Dr. Footnote. And though he was a researcher, he never once looked up his disease and had no desire to join any kind of support group. He wanted to return to his job and work with his beloved photographs and papers. He wanted to write a book about displaced persons in World War II. He wanted to go to Prague for his 50th birthday. He wanted to take Jake and me bike riding in Belgium and run a marathon someday in Tokyo. I have no interest in cancer, he declared, even if it has an interest in me. Yet he knew what the outcome of his illness would be. It was his idea to call the cemetery where my grandparents are buried. A woman quoted prices over the phone. Do you want a single, double, or triple site? When Willem was back on his feet, with a Nike headband on his head covering his scar, and Jake was at preschool, we drove out of the city to the bucolic cemetery on a hillside. I was nervous having Willem drive. I always was nervous with him at the wheel. He had learned in this country as an adult because growing up in the Netherlands, his mode of transportation was a bicycle. Now he loved to put the pedal to the metal and scream Dutch words of joy as he accelerated. We arrived safely at the cemetery and a gentleman carrying a transistor radio to his ear listening to a Mets Cardinals game showed us around. Then we took the proper papers to fill out and my head spun wondering when my time would be. Afterwards, we went out for cheeseburgers and milkshakes and drove back to the city, went home and made love. A week before his fourth birthday, Jake announced that he wanted a cake in the shape of a fire truck. I am not a baker. I have the urge to bake perhaps twice a year, and that usually results in an apple or pumpkin pie with, I confess, store-bought crust. But my son wanted a cake in the shape of a fire truck, and in that way that mothers are able to lift cars off their children's feet in an emergency, I somehow made one. 
I used practically a whole bottle of red dye in the frosting, which in earlier days would appall me. But now I reasoned that if Willem grew up on the purest whole wheat bread and beet salad, perhaps junk food was the key to a long life. I decorated the cake with care, licorice hoses, peppermint wheels, butterscotch headlights, and a lattice of thin pretzels for ladders. It was my offering to my son on what I knew would be his last birthday with his father. We had a party in Central Park. Friends helped push the party favours and food in carts. Willem was able to walk there, slowly, but with elegance, holding my hand, wearing his navy blue Nike headband. The children sat at a picnic table for cake. Jake blew out the candles on the fire truck cake and made a wish. During that period of our lives, he made wishes whenever candles were lighted, and on eyelashes and fluffy dandelions. I always make the same wish, Mom, he'd say, and you can't ever ask me what it is. I didn't ask. Regardless, Willem died. On the day of the funeral, I couldn't get Jake to wear what he called his lots of buttons shirt, but he did acquiesce to a navy blue polo shirt with three buttons. At the synagogue, when Willem's friends were eulogizing him, Jake began to lose patience and tugged on my arm. I want to go to the digging part, he said. Finally, we drove out of the city, dazed and weary, to the cemetery on the hill where Willem and I had blithely picked out a spot and spent our romantic afternoon only months before. A sweet wind blew in the August afternoon. We all took turns shoveling, in the way the rabbi had instructed, with the shovel upside down to show this was a special kind of digging. And then, a picture I thought I would never see, my four-year-old son reached for the shovel, and he too dumped two shovelfuls of dirt onto his father's plain pine coffin. A train whistled in the valley below us, and Jake handed the shovel to his cousin and put his arms straight up in the air. I knew what he wanted. I lifted him up as the rabbi said prayers and we watched the train snaking by. I held him tightly, and we waved to the far-off travellers. Mini Driver, reading Patty Dan's essay, Our Story Ended with a Slow Fade to Black. Patty joins us after the break. We're back. It's Modern Love, the podcast. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. After Patty Dan's Modern Love essay was published, many women with similar experiences began to reach out to her, especially those widows with young children. Emails turned into phone calls, which turned into visits. And it got so that my son would answer the door at age four and say, Mom, you take care of the mom, I'll take care of the kid. The particular thing of being a mother with a very young child was something that many people could relate to, whether it was somebody as myself who had the privilege of saying goodbye to my husband from cancer, or later on I met many 9-11 widows who had, of course, lost their spouses suddenly, wives of soldiers, and we really, you know, were just all there on the playground in a jumble. Patty's new life as a single mom didn't give her that much time for mourning. I would say it was more grief in motion, and I had to work, I had to take care of my kid suddenly alone. It was great joy of having a young child and great sorrow at the 
same time, so there was no contemplative time. You know, I remember I needed a permission slip for my son to go apple picking, you know, and I practically handed his teacher my husband's death certificate. Eventually, she just could not contain the grief. My son would be frightened when I cried, and so I would cry in the shower. And But it was several years later, I was at a deep sleep in the middle of the night, and I woke up sobbing. And that next day, I did join a, a widow and widower's group, but not, not at the beginning. I mean, I don't know how people have time for five stages of grief, quite frankly. Patty did find love again. A reporter for the Baltimore Sun, who had also lost his spouse, wrote a piece on grief. It included a warm review of Patty's memoir about Willem's death. So in the middle of the night, I just wrote to him, Dear Mr. Hill, thank you for the lovely words, and I'm sorry for your loss. We emailed for three months, and my son would come in and say, I see how flirty-flirty you get with him. And I I wasn't aware that I was being flirty-flirty. Patty and Michael Hill started dating and eventually married. At the time, Jake was 11 and Michael's two boys were in college. Today, Jake is 21 and Michael's sons are 28 and 32. Patty says their shared losses have given their sons a lot to talk about over the years. And the same goes for Patty and Michael. I think one of the reasons my husband and I were drawn to each other is along with the fact that we have a lot of fun and share many things and we're both writers, is we did have this loss and we have photographs of my first husband and his first wife up. You know, they're the parents of our children. I mean, this is our story. Writer Patty Dan. Her latest books are The Butterfly Hours, Transforming Memories into Memoir, and The Goldfish Went on Vacation a memoir of loss, and learning to tell the truth about it. She lives in New York. Thanks again to Minnie Driver. She told us that she loved Patty's essay because of its thoughtful simplicity. What is happening is so sad and so awful, and yet the author writes with such grace and a gentle humor and an allowing of the reality. And I love the humanity of that. I love what her life was. I love the dignity that it sounds like her husband died within. And I like thinking about how I hope her life ended up really happy. Minnie Driver. She stars in the ABC comedy Speechless. You can see it online and on demand. Daniel Jones on the darker side of modern love after the break. Here's Daniel Jones, editor of Modern Love. We get more stories about death, about people losing loved ones, than any other topic. The most devastating essays we run and the ones that are about these really torturous experiences are best carried off if they're just told in a very clear-eyed and unsentimental way. And I think that's what Patty pulls off in in this essay. It's such an alarmingly tragic story that there's no need to play that up. <laughs> you know, you don't you just need to say what's happening and focus on those small details that are gonna be so charged with emotion. Next week on Modern Love, Chris Messina of the Mindy Project and the film The Sweet Life on the emotional complexities of organ donation. None of the pamphlets mention the psychological toll of waiting to die or of waiting for, even grimly rooting for, someone else to die so that you can get that person's lungs. They don't explain how not to feel like a monster about that. No one tells you that the physical scars are the easy ones. Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, John Parati, and Amory Sievertson. Extra help this week from producer Catherine Brewer and Matt Reed. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. 
Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for The New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.